Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the Analysis Podcast. In a speech that President Roosevelt gave in 1932, talking about the Republicans and financial elites of his day, FDR said, I read somewhere in a history book about a Roman senator who threw himself into a chasm to save his country. These gentlemen who represent us are of a new breed. They're willing to throw their country into a chasm to save themselves. That seems to describe the American oligarchy today, with save themselves, meaning save a system that has created unprecedented wealth going to a tiny fraction of the society, in spite of the cataclysmic threats of climate change and nuclear war. Biden claims he wants to create the most progressive administration since Roosevelt. He should read some of Roosevelt's speeches on concentration of corporate ownership and fascism to see what that would mean. Now joining us is Bob Poland. He's co-founder of the Perry Institute. That's the Political Economy Research Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts, and author of an upcoming book co-authored with Noam Chomsky titled Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Very happy to be on, Paul. Thank you. Well, let's let's start with sort of the obvious big question. Uh, given COVID, given the crisis, just how deep is this economic crisis going to be? How long might it last? Are we really looking at? Are we really looking at uh, unemployment levels that equal the Great Depression or worse? Well, I you know the the, the fairest answer I think is we, we don't know, and uh, the the mere fact of the you know, extreme uncertainty that we face uh, certainly suggests that alone uh, is a crisis because you can't operate a capitalist economy effectively with these massive levels of uncertainty. So, uh, you know, we, we there's a lot of things, most things we just don't know. I mean, I can tell you where we are now as of today, uh, as of um, April 23rd, the latest figures on um, unemployment insurance claims, initial claims, uh, over the last five weeks, uh, we are now up to 25 million. Uh, so that's uh, 15% of the labor force. It's not the official unemployment statistics, but it's probably a better metric anyway. So in the Great Recession, what we call the Great Recession of a decade or so ago, unemployment never got beyond 10.2%. Now it's at roughly 15% already. Um, so uh, it could keep going up. Uh, if we continue with the lockdown, uh, it almost certainly will go up. Um, on the other hand, one of the things that we that capitalists have learned over the decades, if they don't know how to do anything else, they do know about bailing themselves out. And the bailouts uh, for Wall Street and corporations are absolutely gigantic. Um, they probably are not enough. They almost certainly are not enough, but nevertheless, they're gigantic. I mean, we have the first um, stimulus package, you know, the quote CARES package, of uh, that passed a couple of weeks ago was two trillion, uh, so that was ten percent of GDP. Uh, the money that was supposed to go to small business, uh, the three hundred and fifty billion in loans that could be get got converted into grants, uh, that got used up in one day. So now, you know, as of yesterday, the Congress has passed another one, another four hundred billion or so. For small business, on top of that, you have the Fed uh, uh, standing ready to give unprecedented loans uh, to corporations and Wall Street and to buy assets, to buy corporate bonds and government bonds held by Wall Street firms. And, you know, if you believe the Financial Times, the amount of purchasing they're, ta they're looking at is probably in the range of uh, six to eight trillion dollars. Uh, 
So we're talking about like 35, 40 percent of GDP injected into the economy in a matter of uh, weeks, maybe months. So uh, I have to believe that uh, this is going to prevent uh, something equivalent to the 1930s depression when uh, we didn't know how to do these things. Um, they let the banking system fail. Uh, so the, 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 the capitalist foundation to a large extent is going to be protected deeply. Nevertheless, the severity of the crisis uh, is pulling the other way. So we know that the um, oil companies, fossil fuel companies, they've lost half their value uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, they now are literally uh, not only giving away oil, they are paying people to take oil. Uh, so uh, that's, be that's yeah. because their storage facilities are full. The storage facilities are, are used up. They don't know what to do with it. And so, by the way, that would suggest the oil industry is ripe for nationalization. Um, but overall, I think my best guess is that this is going to be a, a recession comparable in, in its worst phases in severity to the Great Depression, uh, but it's only going to last maybe eight or nine months, and then things will uh, recover. I mean, quote, recover. It, it'll be a very slow, uh, uneven, and the, the nature of the recovery will depend on the political configuration that comes out of the next few months. Uh, WHO and the head of the CDC are saying next winter could be worse than what we have just gone through. Yeah, well, you know, I don't, I'm certainly no expert on pandemics. I also just read that uh, the WHO is projecting 10 million infections in Africa over the next three to six months. They basically have had none so far. There's only been 12,000 recorded. Now we're talking about getting to 10 million. Um, and, you know, they, these, uh, they're actually, there was a paper from the African uh, Economic Research Consortium just yesterday uh, that them, they themselves saying, look, we don't have any health care resources to handle this. So if there are anything close to 10 million, you're going to see uh, people dying in the streets. You're going to see mass starvation. Uh, so if that's the case, then all bets are off. I mean, you know, who knows? I, I, it's just absolutely unprecedented. Maybe we have to go back to the 14th century, to the Black Plague. Yeah, and massive attempted migration. So then you're going to, yeah. the kind of migration we've seen to Europe in the last few years, uh, times who knows what, how much. Right. It's going to be insane. And then Latin America, you look at all the barrios, the uh, slums of all throughout Latin America, it, it's starting there. And as it starts to develop, you could have a similar situation as Africa. And they're talking about a second wave in China. I, I know I'm going on with worst case scenarios, but that's what the scientists no, are saying. I, I think, uh, I think you know, we don't know. I mean, those are realistic scenarios. Um, and I mean, let's say there it's a lot worse it's a lot less bad than what you're suggesting but it's still horrible catastrophic just on the economic front um if we are operating in semi lockdown for not i mean i'm saying you know maybe four or five more months but what if it's 10 months um you know and then the us unemployment is at 20% 25% for 10 months, 11 months. And, and then really, who knows? Things are going to collapse. You know, we've got 30 million small businesses. Uh, what if 70% of them go out, of, you know, go under? There's, uh, a, there's a quote from Roosevelt in the 30s uh, where he talks about, you know, lending money to business to keep them going during this crisis is not enough. The, the government has to do something about the purchasing side. The, people have to be able to buy things. Yep. How much How much of this 
trillions th that are so much of it that's going to the corporations. I know some of it's going as direct payments to people, at least for what is it, 16 weeks or something. Yeah. But, but how much of that money is directly connected to them continuing to hire and pay people, even if they're not able to work or, or not? Is, how, how strictly is that going to be regulated? Well, the, um, the money that's going for, you know, the general lending fund, which is basically for big business and the Wall Street stuff, there, there's no stipulations attached. So the businesses can take the money and lay off all their workers, basically. I mean, there are some weak, there are some weak conditions, but they can be uh, overturned by the Treasury Secretary. The Fed stuff, there's no conditions whatsoever. The um, small business uh, program it does have the condition that it can convert loans can be converted to grants outright grants of money if uh, if the businesses keep their payrolls intact so uh, that is an incentive but um, it also there are a couple of other stipulations and so businesses I've, I've read some articles where the small businesses don't really believe that they are going to be eligible for this, and so they're worried about it. The best proposal out there is the one by Congresswoman Jayapal and the Progressive Caucus uh, of the Democrats on Congress, which basically um, and they, which basically provides a hundred percent of payroll grants to any business. So we're going to government is going to cover your payroll as long as this crisis continues. And uh, that way, one thing, businesses don't have to worry about whether they're going to qualify under the small business provisions. They're not going to be loaded up with debt. I mean, even big corporations, if this goes on for six months and they have no revenue uh, coming out of it, the recovery will be really uh, limited because uh, the heavy debt levels has been piled up while, pe while the businesses had no revenue. So this way, uh, the businesses get their full payroll. Uh, the deal is, of course, that they have to keep everybody in their jobs so that there's no increase in unemployment. Everybody keeps their income as is. Uh, obviously, that's an expensive proposition. I've actually been costing it out. Uh, Congresswoman Jayapal uh, asked me to, and um, you know, for if if this were to go on just for a matter of three four months, we're looking at a, a upwards of three trillion dollars. Uh, so that's already you know twelve percent of GDP. Uh, but that's the, that. I mean, if you want a stabilization program that is going to be reasonably equitable that is going to be effective, that is not going to face bureaucratic obstacles, such as what's happening now with unemployment insurance, because with unemployment insurance, uh, they did uh, pass generous provisions for four months, but you have to get it. You have to get the money. You have to apply. And the unemployment uh, bureaucracy is used to having 200,000 people apply in a week. And now it's five or six million people applying in a week. So uh, that alone is preventing people from getting the money they need just to keep going. So Biden claimed when he did his webcam with Bernie Sanders, when Sanders announced his endorsement, uh, Biden says he wants to have the most progressive administration since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, you've written, there'll be no recovery from the consequences of global warming. And I would assume you would now add the economic crisis now and post COVID-19 unless we succeed in advancing a global green new deal. So what for if this Biden presidency is at the, in the most optimistic way, and I don't know if it's realistic or not, but let's be what what would that administration have to do to one live up to the scale of the crisis and be what he's claiming he wants to be? And I, I share everyone's skepticism uh, about Joe Biden. Uh, but what would it look like? 
Yeah, well, I, I'll just preface that by saying I also share skepticism. I can't claim to be a fan of Joe Biden. Um, but, you know, historical circumstances uh, force people to go in di directions that nobody would have anticipated. I mean, as our friend Noam Chomsky frequently says, the most uh, the last progressive U.S. president was Richard Nixon. Um, and that certainly wasn't something that people would have expected of Nixon at the time, nor uh, would people have at the time said, this guy is progressive because uh, he wasn't for the historical moment. He was reflecting a much more progressive uh, our overall political configuration. And so if there is a strong enough movement, a left movement, that forces uh, the Washington establishment uh, to the left in order to survive, then Joe Biden will, will move with that. He will have to. Uh, so, you know, my the, the, the crisis now is so severe. Um, there's going to have to be innovations uh, across the board, certainly what we one of the obvious things we now recognize is that the u s government not all governments but the u s government has basically unlimited financial capacity to spend as needed to accomplish important things. so if we come out of this crisis and we say, well, we not only need the uh, backstop of just funding uh, to keep uh, businesses and workers alive, but we need a long-term strategy for growth and uh, sustainability and a viable recovery, well, the Green New Deal is the obvious answer. People define the Green New Deal in different ways, but basically it is you know massive investments in um, building a clean energy economy is the cornerstone. And having the fossil fuel industry wind down to zero over the next couple decades. And then we have to defend the uh, well-being of the workers and communities that are dependent right now on the fossil fuel industry. Um, you know, if we do that, that it can be a foundation for a long-term recovery and the transition to a sustainable economy that will stabilize the climate. So d d develop a little bit more concretely what the steps would be. You know, th this is, uh, you know, in the inconceivable <laughs> moment where Bob Poland's asked to advise the Biden administration, but who the hell knows? We're in inconceivable times. <laughs> what what are the steps you would advise or uh, or you might be able to advise his advisors how do you what are the practical steps that this administration yeah, will take yeah. even in the most minimalist yeah. both in terms of dealing with the deep unemployment and the and the global catastrophe not just american and at the same time developing a green new deal yeah well you know implausible things do happen i actually was an advisor uh in the obama administration um and i mean more implausibly, I, I wrote a paper, which I guess, you know, nowadays we would call an outline for a Green New Deal in 2008 that basically became the uh, green features of the 2009 stimulus program. They basically lifted it out of my paper. So I thought that was a pretty good program since I drafted it. Um, you know, it didn't accomplish all that we wanted. But it, it wasn't too bad. And uh, we need something much more uh, aggressive now because this is now a decade later and the climate crisis is worse. Um, okay, let me just, well, be, just, just before you go further, let me just ask one economic question here. Is there any limit to how much money the American government can borrow? And in, in, like – Obviously, there's going to be the argument, well, the American government just borrowed essentially four or five trillion dollars, whatever this ends up being during this phase. Uh, you know, a Green New Deal would be a whole nother trillions. Uh, is, is there any limit to how much the government can borrow? Uh, yes, um, but, well, let, let's, let me first say the U U.S. 
is in a unique position. You know, there is this school of thought called modern money theory, which argues that uh, all governments can borrow as much as they want uh, to achieve full employment. Uh, I don't agree with that. Um, other countries are much more constrained. The reason the U.S. is not so constrained is because uh, the U.S. dollar remains the global uh, currency of international trade. About 80% of global trade uh, is uh, uh, done with dollars. Uh, so everybody needs dollars. And um, therefore, the U.S. can take advantage of that. And uh, everybody needs dollars. So on top of that, uh, in a crisis, um, however bad things are in the U.S., they're worse elsewhere. And so that there is a huge demand for U.S. government bonds. Um, normally, for other countries, uh, even in Europe, uh, if other countries start borrowing, start putting out bonds, uh, at anything close to the rate we've been doing here in the U.S., well, the interest rate on the bond is going to go up because people will see those bonds of Italy or Greece as being uh, more risky because the government is borrow government is borrowing more, which means it makes it more difficult for them to pay back. So that a lender will want a higher interest. rate. Well, the interest rate right now on a U.S. government bond, a five-year treasury bond, is 0.4%. Again, it's like we'll take this for nothing just to have a U.S. government bond because we know the U.S. government isn't going to go out of business. So the U.S. government has this unique capacity at this point of almost unlimited uh, ability to borrow. Now, the only thing that would... Um, weaken that is if, you know, we really get into uh, such a severe crisis that something like a hyperinflation occurs. Uh, a hyperinflation could occur. I would say it's, mo it's very unlikely. A hyperinflation could occur if, you know, the government borrowing, you know, increases, let's say, five, six fold, and the economy is still isn't recovering. And then we really do have this ultra extreme situation, the kind of thing that Milton Friedman talked about that would, he, would, he, he described it as a normal situation, but where you just have money pouring out and you don't have any goods and services being produced. So then that creates a hyperinflation. Under that circumstance, yeah, that U.S. government's, um, the, the, confidence in the dollar would collapse. Can I can what I just make sure I'm understanding that? It is is what would happen that if the American economy is so stagnant, so depressed, such high unemployment, and so much money has been borrowed, that it reaches a point where instead of paying less than a percent, the uh, amount of interest the American government has to start paying starts going up and up. And that becomes inflationary. Am I understanding that? It, let's say it could. It doesn't necessarily have to be, um, but that that, in my view, let's say you know, over the next whatever eighteen months, two years, would be the only scenario in which we could see any limitation on the U.S. government borrowing. Uh, yes, is that ultra stagflation? Yeah. Now, the stagflation that occurred in the 1970s resulted from oil prices uh, in, you know, going up sixfold. Uh, that obviously is not going to happen now. And by the way, if we transition out of oil and into green energy, we will be able to ensure that the prices are going to be stable. So that would take away the prospect of any kind of oil shock derived stagflation. If we reach a point where people, investors, the, the elites of the world, actually find that even borrowing uh, American T-bills they don't consider safe anymore and start to withdraw from that, is there an alternative? I mean, is that just become well, such isn't. a shit show that, that, that the whole system starts unravel? 
Yeah. So, you know, if, if we're at the point at which people, investors don't trust American treasuries, then yes, we are in such a deep crisis. And, you know, the, the level of uncertainty is so high. I mean, sure, one could say, well, well look, China is a stronger economy, but China is uh, obviously not so strong right now. Uh, you know, the IMF itself is predicting China will continue to grow, but at basically 0.1 or 1%, you know, so that is a collapse from their uh, growth trajectory, uh, which has been for 40 years, 8%, 8-9%. So to say, oh, well, the Chinese yuan is, an, is a viable alternative to the dollar is, uh, yes, is really projecting something that seems implausible at this point. There'd so, have to be a radical change in the uh, Chinese people's ability to consume because China's so dependent on the American market. And if the American market right. is screwed, then what can China... Yeah, and the, yeah, and the, and the global supply chains uh, from which China, you know, is, the, is like the foundation... Who knows where, you know, those are flat on their back also. So to say that, you know, we have a clear alternative to U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries via China, to me, just seems a really like an unlikely scenario over the next two years. So if, if investors don't want dollars and they don't want U.S. treasuries, I have no idea. And they don't want, they won't want uh they won't want oil. They, they, so uh, gold, you know, what gold doesn't do you any good. Uh, you can't eat the gold. So I really don't know what the world would look like. And, you know, if we're looking at a two year scenario in which investors say we just we can't take any more dollars. Has capitalism exhausted itself? I mean, everyone thought it would eventually, and of course it's being predicted over and over again over the decades, but have we actually reached a point where it has uh, and or looking at some, you know, kind of either uh, some in, in certain places of the world, at least, I don't know if it could be done in the United States, but a, a radical transformation towards, towards some form of socialism and or some form of dark ages. Uh, uh yeah, I mean, capitalism as we know it, I think, well, it already had exhausted itself because we were already in, <coughs> we were, excuse me, we were already at a transition out of neoliberalism. I mean, the, the global emergence of neo-fascism, you know, Trump obviously is the most obvious example, but Bolsonaro in Brazil, yes. <coughs> Orban and, and um, Hungary and Turkey, um, you know, Netanyahu and Israel. Uh, we have, a, a, you know, a huge uh, movement out of away from uh, neoliberalism because neoliberalism didn't deliver well-being for um, middle class, working class people. Unfortunately, the response uh, has been primarily uh, neo-fascism, and neo-fascism was able to incorporate racism and anti-immigration uh, attacks at their core, so that you could blame, you know, you could kick down and, instead of kicking up, and the left uh, agenda of attacking capitalism and building some egalitarian alternative hasn't really taken off. But uh, I think this is a moment where, where it can. And so the, the critical thing, I think, for us is to define what we mean when we say we have an alternative that's viable, that people can believe in. Uh, I think, you know, I, for all its flaws, I think the Bernie Sanders campaign did a great job in raising uh, these issues and defining what a, an alternative to neoliberalism and neo-fascism could be. Uh, so I think that's on that's on the table. Corbyn, you know, did reasonably well on that also. Uh, so we just have to push it to the point at which these things become um, hegemonic uh, to the point at which they become dominant political forces. We're not there yet, but I think there's movement in that direction. 
you raised the issue of the nationalization of the fossil fuel industry as a, a really necessary component of developing an effective Green New Deal. Um, I'd add to that, and uh, I think you would too, uh, the nationalization of certain sections of the banking industry. As, as long as finance is controlled by who it is controlled by, and these days it's so concentrated ownership in, into a few asset manager funds like BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street that control Goldman Sachs and the other places. But on the whole, the finance, uh, there's a quote from Roosevelt about when private interests dominate government are stronger than government. It's essentially the definition of fascism. Well, we're definitely in a situation where corporate interests, private interests, but specifically banking interests control government. Um, if, it seems to me if there isn't both nationalization of fossil fuel and at least a, a section of the banking industry, which without all this public subsidy would be down the toilet, uh, one, the government could buy doesn't have to just out and out nationalize. It could simply buy sections, enough sectors of the uh, banking industry uh, to have an effective public interest banking system. Uh, is, is there any other way other than that? Well, I, yes. I mean, I think we have to realize that the Wall Street would have collapsed 12 years ago if they hadn't been bailed out. Uh, so Wall Street only exists on the foundation of public subsidies. Uh, you know, the bailout in uh, 2007, 2009 uh, added up to about $12 trillion. Uh, so that was, for the time, that was over, let, let's say, 60% of U.S. GDP. And the bailouts on Wall Street dwarfed the tiny little $800 billion stimulus program that Obama passed uh, in 2009. So uh, now here we are back again, uh, you know, 12 years later, only 12 years later, and the bailout that uh, was undertaken uh, during the Great Recession is also now going to look puny relative to what Wall Street is going to get from the Fed. So really, uh, without Fed bailouts, we would have no financial system uh, operating whatsoever now. So, yes, it's certainly it is clear that uh, maybe we let some of these institutions fail or, and the, or the government just take them over. And then at that point, we start to define what a financial system, banking institutions could look like that operate under some kind of public well-being criteria as opposed to squeezing every penny of profit out of uh, out of working people in this economy. So, yes, we here's should. A, here's, a, here's another quote from Roosevelt. This is uh, another 1938. The justification of private profit is private risk. We cannot safely make America safe for the businessman who does not want to take the burden and risks of being a businessman. Right, exactly. So these uh, these big uh, Wall Street firms and big corporations have been pampered under neoliberalism uh, into uh, getting uh, socialism for themselves. Uh, so the government, the we the people, uh, assume their risks. And they keep all their profits. And that's the system that they have, and that's the system that they like. And sure, why wouldn't they like it? So, uh, but, you know, as Roosevelt, the quote you have there perfectly captures it. Um, if these businesses can, literally cannot operate without a foundation of government bailouts, then they shouldn't exist. Uh, if they if they're going to exist as private entities, they have to be private entities that accepts some standards of social responsibility. Major, not just uh, in rhetoric, but in actual practice, they have to be committed to some standards of social well-being because they are beneficiaries of the public uh, interventions. And the fact that they won't. 
means that they need to be nationalized, at least some significant share of them. Okay, so now put on your imagination hat. So just imagine there is a really progressive mass movement, very conscious, national, assuming people can get into the streets, it can rally hundreds of thousands, even millions of people in the streets in support of a progressive agenda. This progressive movement has just elected uh, progressives that now control Congress and have a progressive president facing, of course, and the en- big enemies, both in finance, military industrial complex, and so on. So it's not some la di da utopia here, but I mean, <laughs> even what I just described is a little la di da, but whatever. What, what would that progressive government do? So the, to boil it down, if there was a federal government, then you can apply this to states and cities. And, and maybe what I'm saying is actually more possible in states and cities than federally, at least to begin with. Anyway, what, what does this progressive government do if, for exa- in, this, in this situation? We've talked about nationalizing fossil fuel, sections of finance. What else does it do? Well, we definitely nationalized the uh, health insurance industry. So, yes, we have a green, we have a Medicare for all. Uh, and by the way, um, Jayapal, Congresswoman Jayapal also has an excellent bill that would extend Medicare, existing Medicare to anyone who's uh, experienced unemployment. Uh, so that could be a stepping stone to Medicare for all. So if we have uh, a health insurance system that covers everybody decently, uh, we have a Green New Deal Foundation, which is transforming the energy economy, uh, also agriculture. Um, Then we, uh, on that foundation, we can also uh, operate according to the 1946 version of the Full Employment Act, which is you actually guarantee jobs for everybody at decent pay. Um, so I think that's a pretty good foundation. We will have gotten rid of the fossil fuel industry that has to go anyway. We will have a transition for everybody who uh, is negatively affected by the demise of the fossil fuel industry. We have uh, something akin to a full employment economy uh, with uh, a decent wage standard. Uh, and uh, we have a global uh, global Green New Deal, I should say, um, that is going to save the planet, that's going to eliminate the threat of climate change. And I'd, I'd add to that a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, from what you described earlier, what's happening in Africa, but it's going to be happening in parts of Asia and Latin America. There's going to have to be a massive bailout of oh, yeah. Asia, Af- sections of Asia and Africa and Latin America, or they, this, this is going to become a ca- catastrophe on a scale never heard of. Uh, that's right. So, um, the you know, the U.S. has been the stingiest uh, high-income country in terms of uh, foreign assistance. So we give 0.2% of GDP, so that's uh, $40 billion dollars for foreign aid. So countries like Sweden and Norway give five times more as a share of GDP, 1%, but even 1% is nothing. Um, At the very least, during this pandemic, what we really need is uh, the U.S. government to be giving something like a trillion. Uh, It's the only way. I mean, if we really are seriously if the WHO is anywhere close to accurate in saying there's going to be 10 million infections in Africa, and as you said, let's double that number for the low-income economies of Asia and Latin America. I mean, that so that would be conservative. So 20 million people in poor countries that have very fragile uh, public health uh, infrastructures, this could be, you know, as let's go back to the the black death the plague of 1350 uh we could be looking at something like that and and let's say we don't even care about any of those people we couldn't give a damn but of course what if we have 20 million people infected in poor countries 
of course the virus is going to come back to the U.S. And, yeah. So uh, we need an intervention on that scale. We need a trillion. I mean, we just did two trillion in the U.S. Uh, through the Treasury and an untold trillions more through the Fed. So we need a trillion coming out of the U.S. and another trillion coming out of the rest of the high income countries to at least provide some decent uh, stabilization of healthcare systems in the low income economies. Uh, that would be a low number, I think. Uh, but we, we need that and we can we can argue for it strictly on absolutely selfish grounds that we have to control the uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, add two things to that. One, it's not like there's not enough wealth to do that. It's not just about borrowing. Jeff Bezos could throw in practically a trillion all by himself. Right. So it, it's not about just necessarily endless borrowing. There is such a thing called taxation. And, and the other thing, just to remind people, because I'm sure people listening to this know what I'm about to say, but why is it Africa has no decent health care system? It's because, you know, from World War II on, the natural development of even modern capitalist and certainly socialist economies in Africa were all undermined, and destroyed, and leaders were uh, murdered. And, and in Latin America, dictator after dictator supported by U.S. foreign policy that led to uh, the undermining of, of natural development, even capitalist development in Latin America. So it's not like the United States and, and Europe, too, to some extent, aren't responsible for the, these places being so vulnerable. Of course. Yeah. yeah. There's no question about it. I mean, having done um, some uh, work, policy work in both Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and trying to introduce some, you know, egalitarian programs that and, and connecting with progressive movements there. Yeah. I mean, we you, you're, you're facing massive obstacles that have been uh, built up for decades through the undermining of any kind of uh, progressive movements, progressive politics by imperialist powers, starting with the United States. The danger of war in moments like this, it seems to me, is very high. Not just through kind of normal competition between, uh, in these days it will be China and the United States, it could be Russia, but it's a very aggressive militarist government in power right now. Uh, I, as, as skeptical we are about as Biden, um, Trump, I believe, and is and I think you do too. It, it, it represents a kind of uh, not just authoritarianism, but a, a real potential fascism surrounded by uh, the worst, most right-wing elements of the oligarchy, allied with uh, you know very backward sections uh, of uh, the society, um, and it's a very, very dangerous moment in many ways. But not the least of which, uh, the threat of war. And you have Steve Bannon, who's still apparently in Trump's ear, openly advocating a military confrontation in the South China Sea. Um, you have Trump and some other people in the Pentagon and, and other people actually seriously talking about the possible use of tactical nuclear weapons. Um, and of course, Iran where Trump, this Trump administration has been very dedicated to bringing down the government of Iran. And now with Iran in such terrible shape as a result of sanctions, uh, COVID-19 and the mismanagement of the economy by the Iranian government. But it, I think that pales in significance to what the first two factors uh, are responsible for. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, so it seems to me that whenever we're talking about the Green New Deal, and we're talking about what needs to be done, we, we, we have to also talk about uh, the danger of the nuclear weapons industry and nuclear strategy, the size of the Pentagon budget, and uh, not that there isn't enough money to pay for all that and do the other stuff, a point you've made, but just the inherent danger of all of that. 
I mean, you're, the 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 threat of war obviously is increased, uh, as as we mentioned, you mentioned a bit ago. The you know the pressures for migration are going to become severe again if we talk about ten million infections in Africa and comparable of problems, uh, catastrophic circumstances in, say, the Caribbean, Central America. Um, people are going to want to get out of there, however, and that is going to uh, create pressures for uh, U.S., for Trump, who's going to love this stuff, who's going to want to blame everything on immigrants, foreigners. So the opportunity to start a war and deflect attention from his own failures is going to be close to irresistible. And obviously Iran is a, is a, uh, is a big target, always has been. I mean, Trump has, to date, has resisted the, more, the most militaristic uh, advice he's been given on on Iran, but um, how long is he going to resist if it really gets to the point at which he thinks he's going to lose the election unless he can change the story? If the story out there in the media is that Trump has screwed up uh, the management of the COVID-19 crisis, which is a story that is increasingly becoming obvious, but if that story really sticks and he thinks he can't reverse it through his usual kinds of rhetorical somersaults, um, sure, he's going to want to start a war. Um, And so that is a, uh, yes, that's a real threat. And um, we have to be really totally on guard around that. All right. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Bob. Great, great uh, to do this. And I really wish you all the best with this venture. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us on the analysis.news podcast.